Good morning, everyone. I'm Anna Conkey, the Director of Foundation for Children with Neuroimmune Disorders, and I'm really happy to be here with Dr. Richard Pry, who is a pediatric neurologist and an expert in both PANS as well as autism. So thanks so much for being here, Dr. Pry. We're really happy to have you and uh, be able to learn from you this morning. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and ask you the first question we have, which is, can you explain why there tends to be a worsening in symptoms in children with both autism as well as PAN sometimes around puberty? Great question. Um, you know, because there's a lot of stuff going on with puberty, but there's also stuff going on with age, you know, and, um, um, and I don't, uh, and a lot of people want to, um, blame it on hormones and puberty, and there might be a connection there. We definitely know that, that hormones can play into changes um, in behavior um, and changes in other things like seizures um, um, and other parts of physiology, but that's not necessarily the case. So I would, I would say, you know, we have to be, be very careful. But I think it's, it's a really important time, this time of transition into um, not only adolescence, but young adulthood. And it's something we don't know a lot about. Um, there, there's many reasons for worsening of symptoms. Um, and it does seem that um, um, from adolescence all the way into young adulthood, we do see in some individuals that symptoms get worse. Seizures start, seizures that were not there before, we know are, are something that uh, can develop. Um, and um, it, it could it be um, a type of um, neuroimmune uh, pans pandas type of thing, autoimmune encephalopathy? That's definitely a possibility, but there's other types of possibilities too. So I think you have to be very careful anywhere along the time where you see it, some type of change or decline in cognition behavior along with that question, in children who have had regressions, um, who either have autism or PANS, do you recommend a lumbar puncture to look at things more closely? And if so, uh, what markers within the cerebral spinal fluid are critical to consider or look at? Uh, I wish I had an absolute answer for that. I think that uh, definitely a lumbar puncture should be considered, um, depending on the, on the picture. Definitely, if there's an abrupt um, regression, you know, something that happens, um, especially if it happens with some type of fe fever or infection, um, a lumbar puncture is definitely indicated. Um, um, other uh, times when there's a slower decline, it's not exactly clear that a lumbar puncture is exactly needed at that time. And the contribution of a lumbar puncture um, is, um, um, uh, is not always... Um, um, and it doesn't always give you the answers that you want. Um, many times what we're finding, I think, and I think what we're going to find is that uh, there's different types of ways that the um, nervous system can be affected by the immune system. Um, one of the more classic autoimmune encephalitis where we actually see an inflammation inside the brain. And then I think that with some kiddos, we're seeing what I would more call an autoimmune encephalopathy. That is that there may not be any type of very obvious inflammation in the brain, but definitely the immune system is either sending out um, either antibodies or cytokines that are somehow disturbing the way the brain functions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you have to take a look at, at both sides of the equation. Within that, are there certain markers that you would suggest looking at in nearly all children who have had regressions, or is that really specific to each child's clinical picture? I think that, uh, that uh, a child with regression, if it's not obvious, um, and, and even if, if you think it is obvious because they've had a seizure or something, um, if there's a regression, I think they should have a very comprehensive um, workup. And um, this includes, um, especially if it's an abrupt regression, um, you know, a lumbar puncture, I think, uh, and spinal tap are something that uh, can be very helpful um, looking at both neuroimmune and neurometabolic um, uh, problems. So, you know, we see that uh, definitely there's signs of neuroimmune problems. We can see antibodies, oligoclonal bands, other types of signs that there is actually um, the immune system is extremely active. In the, uh, in the nervous system. We also can see secondary effects on metabolism. Of course, cerebral folate deficiency is something that we're 
um, finding uh, more and more, um, both because of the you can uh, trigger the antibody to the folate um, carrier, which will stop folate from getting into the nervous system. But I also think that we're going to find just the inflammatory response may um, consume folate and other types of um, uh, nutrients, other types of vitamins, B12, tetrahydrobiopterin, and such in the nervous system, and actually cause an encephalopathy. So those are really easy to fix. So I know I encourage whenever you do a lumbar puncture to also measure uh, metabolism, uh, metabolites, including uh, folate, uh, tetrahydrobiopterin, neurotransmitters, uh, B12, um, and uh, and other uh, um, metabolic lactate pyruvate uh, amino acids too, in addition to those immune markers. So, you know, whenever I do a lumbar puncture, you know, I don't want to have to do another one. Um, so I try and collect everything I can. Um, so one thing people um, get worried about is that they're going to collect too much fluid. Sure. You know, um, you actually um, replenish the fluid in your nervous system um, about three times a day. Okay. So the idea that taking too much out, you can't really take too much out. If you take even 20 cc's, which people would th think are a lot, is a lot, that will be replenished in a couple hours. Um, and so the body is very good at making new CSF. So um, really uh, it's important, especially if you don't know the origin of the regression to take a very um, detailed look. And that would include, if you're gonna do a lumbar puncture, uh, an MRI um, also. Sure. to make sure that um, that there's no demyelinating lesions or to look for any inflammation or infection. So I would, I would definitely think that, that any child that has an abrupt regression um, should have um, a, uh, a very comprehensive workup. And then, of course, in the blood, you want to look for some of the inflammatory markers and the antibodies um, that uh, we see associated with autoimmune encephalitis and all, autoimmune encephalopathy. So it sounds like you're also saying that you don't believe that PANS is solely autoimmune in nature. Is that correct? I think that, uh, so, you know, um, I, I think that it's correct. I think that um, it's, uh, that um, there's definitely a, an immune mediated um, 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 a portion of it, but I, I would be, I, I wouldn't want to pigeonhole it you know, into saying that it's that it's um, one specific thing because I think it's a much broader um, um, entity. And right. we've had um, actually success, you know, treating kids, actually finding out that really they had um, more of the, um, the signs of uh, cerebral folate deficiency, that their folate was low. And after treating them with leucovorin, they responded dramatically rather than having to go to things like IVIG or other immune modulating treatments. So some of your research has focused on using Cunningham panel markers to predict efficacy of IVIG in children with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, can you comment on what might cause increased CAM kinase 2 in children? I like the CAM kinase because theoretically um, what Dr. Cunningham um, showed was that when the antibodies bind to the um, to the cells, how they may be affecting their cells. It can, they can be affecting the cells in many different ways, um, but um, one of the ways is by elevating um, CAM kinase um, in the cells. So somehow there's an activation of the um, through second messengers. There's an activation of um, CAM kinase two, and CAM kinase two um, in turn increases the output of dopamine and actually modulates NMDA and AMPA receptors, or on, which is the glutamate pathway. So um, I like the Cunningham panel because you not only have these auto, um, these auto antibodies that you're measuring, but then essentially you're taking the sample, putting it on a neuroendocrine cell line in the lab and asking if it actually disrupts cellular metabolism. Sure. Some of, the, some of the problems that we have is that, you know, even, first of all, you know, the Cunningham panel measures four very important antibodies, you know, and then there's other panels that measure other antibodies, but we know there's probably thousands of antibodies out there that we can't measure, you know. Sure. So, 
so the the question is you know um, is the is it an antibody that you know we're 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 missing are the antibodies that are elevated affecting the um, um, this, uh, the cells in the body. They may or may not be. You can have neutralizing antibodies to autoantibodies, which keep them in check. We don't check for those, um, you know. And uh, and so, you know, I think that the the uh, cam kinase is a nice check to show that the antibodies, when they bind onto a neurotype tissue, they're actually disrupting the uh, molecular mechanisms in the cell that uh, that that make it work and which increase dopamine output and can interfere with uh, glutamate uh, neurotransmission. Um, so it, and, and so I like that as a second check, although I'll say it's even more complicated than that. So, you know, that's why it's very important to make sure that you have an expert um, that can understand these panels to interpret them. They're, they're not a, a black and white type of um, interpretation. Similarly, do you think that mitochondrial dysfunction or disease has a relationship to autoimmune disease or PANS? So, you know, we see, um, uh, so, you know, um, in the kids that, uh, that we see autoimmune encephalopathy, um, we definitely see that uh, many of them have mitochondrial dysfunction. The paper we published in, I think, the second case, um, uh, we show that uh, one kiddo that... Um, that had mitochondrial disease uh, that then uh, developed more of kind of a PANS type of uh, picture and acute onset after recovering had acute onset of, of behavioral regression and then did actually wonderful in IVIG. Um, there's, um, there's many reasons why the mitochondria and oxidative stress um, are involved um, in the autoimmune process. And I think it goes both ways. That is when you have inflammation um, it uh, it uh, causes stress on, on the body, okay, and can push down um, or you require um, mitochondrial, the mitochondria to work harder to support the immune cells and the rest of the body. Um, and so if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, um, you will um, um, uh, be sicker. You won't be able to recover. Your immune system won't be able to work. Um, in the same sense, um, the, you know, um, uh, with oxidative stress, we see oxidative stress because of inflammation. We saw it because of uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, but oxidative stress itself can cause damage and inflammation itself, which can then, you know, prolong the recovery process or make the, um, the, uh, the disorder worse. So I think all of these things very much um, play in with each other. Um, and you, and many times, you know, there may be a pure immune disorder, but I think what we see a lot of times is a mixture of these things. And I think it's important to take a broader look um, right. when you want to really treat a patient. You want to really want to look at them from all angles to make sure that uh, that really you're supporting their body in every way you can. And we see this with kiddos that might have mitochondrial dysfunction who are on IVIG. If the mitochondria is not supported, um, IVIG can... Um, uh, can not work and actually cause more side effects. Sure. Um, that is because it does put a stress on the body. And if, and if your mitochondria um, and your body is not ready for the treatment, then um, the treatment may not work. And it's a reason for treatment failure. And is there a way that you support the body in circumstances similar to this? Uh, most definitely. I mean, one of the, the ways that um, uh, we um, look at uh, an individual that may have, you know, acute onset um, changes, first of all, is take a comprehensive look as I have described. But many times we uh, work on metabolism first sure. um, because it's so easy to treat in the, in the sense of um, side effects. You know, one of the problems with, you know, neuroimmune disorders is that the treatments a lot of times have um, um, adverse effects. Sure. Um, and so um, really I think that, um, you know, with, with, of course, you know, the first rule of medicine, do no harm. You want to start out with the least harmful treatments that are most effective. And we find that supporting metabolism is some of the ways that can um, help at first. Um, and then we go on from there. And if there's clearly a need for immune modulating treatments, um, then, um, you know, 
use those kind of uh, secondarily after we've supported the body to try and help the body itself, um, you know, uh, stabilize. Excellent. And is mast cell activation syndrome something that you evaluate your patients for as well? Uh, you know, it's something that um, I'm really interested in. Um, I, and one of the problems with it is the inavailability of, um, of clinical tests for it. And so I, I have, but I have, a, I must say that the tests that I have at hand that, you know, insurance usually pays for that the, the, their kind of standard tests in labs are limited and they're usually negative. Okay. So I, I think that, um, uh, uh, that, uh, that there's probably a lot of mast cell activation that I'm, that personally I'm under treating, you okay. know, and it's, I, I think it's an important entity and with having more available tests, to really, um, you know, identify it, I think that we'll be able to identify it and treat it, and it's an important part of the uh, of the treatment um, uh, plan. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Pry. This is really informative, and we really appreciate your time today. Take care. Have a great day.